Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a virtual program. My name is Shugato Ray, and I'm an associate professor, South and Southeast Asian Art, History of Art Department at UC Berkeley. Today's program is the second in a series of programs created through a partnership between the Thompson Center for the Humanities at Berkeley and the Commonwealth Club. The focus of the series is catastrophe and the essential role that story and storytelling play in helping us face and survive catastrophes. The goal is to share knowledge and renew hope at this critical time by discussing literary and visual accounts of catastrophic change through history. Interestingly, this program was in development before the coronavirus crisis began. Now I speak to you from the San Francisco Bay Area, which is one of the first regions in the country to go into a lockdown, and it's just beginning to emerge. This new series of programs seek to remind us that it is not the first time that human societies have faced catastrophic collapse. Today's program focuses on the relationship between the natural world and the sacred realm, especially as it has developed in India over the last several centuries of civilization and the rise of the Anthropocene era. Join me today for the conversation, joining me today for the conversation is Ranu Mukherjee. Ranu is a visual artist who makes painting, animation, and large-scale installations. And before jumping in, I want to remind people that you can ask questions. Please post your questions in the YouTube chat area, and they will be forwarded to me. Okay, let's start, Ranu. <laughs> Thank you, Sugata. Hello. Good to see you. Hello, everybody who's out there, wherever you are. Thanks, Commonwealth Club and the Townsend Center for having us. Um, yeah, I was excited to do this before, but now it seems really prescient. Um, and I'm going to just show one project of mine to get the conversation started. Before I show slides, um, I wanted to show this piece of fabric because I can in this, this format, which I can't do on stage. This is a print um, and it is a pattern that I made that comes from images of the youth climate marches in the last three, three years or so, abstracted into a pattern and printed on a, to a piece of sari cloth. Um, this is a Jamdani sari, which is made on a jacquard loom. And this is something that I do in order to make raw material for the collage works that I do. Um, and so there's a relationship between the loom, the jacquard loom, which is sort of a proto-digital technology and the digital, um, the digital information that I'm printing onto it. So those things are having a conversation in that print. And I, I wanted to show you that because it's a little bit harder to see in the slides that I'm going to show. Um, but now I'm going to share my screen and go on to the slide presentation. Um, there we go. Um, so here we have the first slide. This is a slide of uh, the project I'm going to talk about, which is called A Bright Stage. And it was on view at the De Young Museum in middle of 2018 through early uh, 2019, so about six months. And the project um, was installed in Wilsey Court, which is a public space at the center of the museum. So the invitation to do this project came through Claudia Schmuckley, who is the curator in charge there. And she really just invited me and she's done this with other artists to, to just inhabit this space with a piece of art. And the middle wall there is about 50 by 30 feet. So the space is quite monumental and it is a public space again, which means that it doesn't, there's no entry fee. So it is technically a public space. And when she invited me to do this, besides thinking I need to paint the walls um, a color to take, take it out of white space and to bring, I thought a lot about the idea of bringing the outside into the museum. And I also thought a lot about um, public voices and public action. And I thought about the banyan tree, which is what I'm really gonna talk about now. And maybe I'm gonna be a storyteller for a little bit to talk about this plant, which is, um, a plant, the banyan tree is a really incredible natural form that I've been thinking about for a while, but the, the, the scale of that space really gave me the opportunity to spend some time doing some research and think about it some more. 
Um, the banyan is a species of fig tree and it is sacred in many cultures, but particularly in India and other parts of um, the Indian subcontinent. Um, and this is an image of a cotton procession moving underneath the tree, spending time setting up um, a caravan, you know, getting shelter and shade and um, the tree. So for a long time has been a source of shade, a source of shelter and, and now currently is sort of the site of many public parks. So there's one outside of Calcutta that is like a sort of small city scale tree. So it's one tree. And um, one of the things that's fascinating about it is the way that it grows. So it grows um, outwards and down. So it starts with its fig tree. So the bird, a bird will take a fig from one tree and go and poop a seed out into another tree. And then the epiphyte will start in the crux of a tree that's already existent. And the tree will start, the roots will start to grow downward and outward. And as it grows down, it often strangles the host tree. So in a sense, the tree is both sacred and it's also this kind of monstrous plant. And it's um, what I was thinking of as it has its own sort of colonial mentality. So it's a tree that is the home to many species, but it also has a colonial, um, a colonial way of propagating itself. Um, so it, in my project sort of became like this metaphor for where ecology and culture come together, um, and also uh, talking about its role in, or the role that it ended up playing in these kind of um, uh, confrontations between imperial or colonial power and indigeneity. Um, so this is an image of a, uh, a person in India being hung by the British soldiers in the 1800s um, because they were rebelling against the, the colony. And so they used these trees and the limbs of these trees because they were, a, they were sacred. They could do a kind of double kind of injury on a population. It's a very, it's a handy because it has these branches, but also, you know, there's a way in which um, this has happened in the United States as well, that these trees become, because they're sacred, the symbolic power of the violence is, is ever stronger. So um, that was, those were some of the starting points for this project of wanting to bring um, a kind of natural form into the museum to think about these sorts of, um, these sorts of how this sort of idea might might exist today in terms of the public voices that we are hearing and who's trying to find ground and how. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna walk a little bit through the project with these slides. So this was the left wall. Um, some of the images, some of, so these pieces are all made on linen with um, cloth elements that were used as collage. And um, some of them are more tree-like than others. So there's a sort of, you know, abstraction to the idea of the tree. The tree was like both a protagonist and a guide as well as a formal device. Um, this particular piece, some of them had these line drawings. And so there was a way in which you could see the project from lots of different points of views. You could see it from the ground, but also from these second level windows. This drawing was um, a drawing of a protester holding up an image of a journalist named Gauri Lankesh, who was killed a few years ago for her pro-democracy journalism, um, speaking out against Hindu fundamentalism in India now. Um, and so this was a protest where the people were holding up her, the image of her face, um, you know, a little bit like the I am Trayvon protests that happened in the United States. Um, so, and then some of the pieces, these, these elements of fabric you see on this piece, this pattern was actually made of the images of the vigils for the same person. And so, you know, what I was doing here was making these patterns, printing them onto the fabric, and then using the fabric as collage material to think about the ways that these histories will kind of grow also. They grow out. I mean, I loved the idea of thinking about the pattern of growth, the outward and down movement of the tree, and also the way that um, media images kind of appear and we think about them and then they disappear. And, but, but that maybe the things that happen there have another life and are, are kind of continuing on to, into the future in other ways. So that's a close up of that piece. 
And then on the center wall, um, I was using, so each of these pieces had a different shape. Uh, we're using images of the women's marches on this wall in some of these patterns and um, March for Our Lives and, the, and the, also the, um, pro the Dakota Pipeline water protection protests that were happening at a time. So again, the sort of cultural and the ecological go hand in hand in a lot of my work and I'm trying uh, really hard to make work where the, the ecological impetus is a, is a kind of agency and also that the kind of nature and culture can't be separated. So this is, um, these line drawings were images of some of the, the people who are doing those protests that are coming out of the news and the patterns asso are associated with those images also. I was thinking of this in a way that because of the trees being um, home to the spirits in lots of cultures, like could I make, something that functioned that way for these images. So, you know, while we may not be seeing the images that we saw eight, six months ago in the media, maybe the patterns or the sort of futurist or the, the futurity of those kind of movements and how maybe just like the prop roots of the Banyan, they're sort of looking for ground and looking for a way to root into culture. Um, I guess that's a hopeful way of, of thinking about things, but... Um, yeah, I think that those those hopeful things are important. This one shows you some of the um, the places where I chose to make the work very tree-like. So some of the some of the linen pieces were very angular and abstract, while others really clearly related to the shape of a tree. Some of them didn't have any collage at all, like this blue one. Um, and then there were videos which were a series of extinct birds that were forming and unforming in a sequence. And so there was sort of some movement happening in the room, which was actually, it began as a, um, they were, I was sort of thinking of them as spirits in these trees and this idea that the dead can continue to speak. But also Michael DeYoung, who started the museum, had a collection of stuffed birds. So I was thinking about this idea of a 19th century museum and sort of the colonial roots of the museum and how those sorts of histories carry on um, into the present. This is a detail um, that I, I put in here because this is a, an image of some people. These were migrants that were waiting at the southern border of the United States around the time that I was doing this work. I started making these line drawings um, the summer before the 2016 election. And it was a time when I was really having, it was just really overwhelming everything that was going on. And then when the elections came, it was even more overwhelming. And so part of my way of handling all of that was to trace these images of things. And I was thinking a lot about the landscape and the futurity that these people, like wherever the people end up will be communicate would will will affect the the future of that place and that they will add something to that place so it also it was like can I put them in a safe space in my work even if they're not in a safe space in their life so you know now of course I'm thinking a lot about the people that are are stuck now um, either in cages or at one side of the border and how those migrations and the sort of issues of climate change are totally interwoven um, this wall is another one where the tree become, the tree shapes are really clear and there's also um, these patterns on that wall all came, a lot of them came from the migrations that were happening in the Mediterranean Sea at the time. So I used a lot of the images of the boats and things. And those are just sort of traces that people can't see, but for me they're, it's really important they're there. Um, so then zooming out, you know, just this was a sort of um, a situation again where people could see the work from all different kinds of angles and I wanted it to be um, a place where people, again, the, the video was creating a kind of movement. So it was about bringing a sort of animated quality into this space, bringing the outside in and also um, making an image of landscape that was using this kind of very non-pastoral plant, which is kind of monstrous and has this, this, this really rich history to, you know, also just think about the way that historically landscape has been um, a, in some cultures of force that is about sort of containment and domestication. And so I was really trying to sort of do the opposite and yet include these sort of pub the idea of like the public and public space and public voices. 
um, yeah, so that's what I have to say about that project. And then when I was invited to do this talk with Sugata, I was really excited because his book, Climate Change and the Art of Devotion was introduced to me through this invitation. And I read it and was, you know, it was amazing to me to read about, um, you know, the this history of another, of another climate change, another period of climate change and a period in an art history where um, there was this agency um, inherent in people's relationship to the landscape. So, Sugata, please take it away. I'd like to hear more about your book. Well, thank you, Ranu, and very kind of you. Um, I, I, I hope we return to some of these conversations uh, as part of a discussion later in terms of thinking about both uh, indigenous activism, but also how one rethinks the history of colonialism and the re relationship between colonialism and sacred groves. So as Ranu mentioned, my book, which came out last year, uh, focuses on climate change in this particular uh, pilgrimage site in North India called Braj, a site that was supposed to be where the god Krishna is believed to have spent his youth. Now, incidentally, George Harrison uh, composed It Is He after he visited Braj, and that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> but no, <laughs> but I mean, I'm a big Beatles fan. But more, more than that, I think what is so interesting about this uh, site, and you can see it in this uh, image of devotees circumambulating a, a, for, a, a, a mountain or little hillock, is that in the 16th century, a new sort of devotion develops in Braj, in which it's not just the image of the icon in the temple, but, but the, the natural environment, the rocks, the forest, even the dust of Braj is considered sacred. So much as one would go to a Hindu temple and circumambulate the temple, here we see pilgrims circumambulate a hillock. Now, what is more interesting is that this new practice of devotion emerges precisely at a point where there are massive monsoon failures, El Nino induced monsoon failures in Africa, in South America, in Asia, and scholars now call it the little ice age. So on the one hand, you have this rise of devotion, of worshiping the natural environment. On the other hand, you have massive monsoon failures. So one of the chapters in this book focuses on what is pertinent to our discussion, the idea of sacred groves. So the next image, what I have is uh, this very interesting uh, project by William Roxburgh, who's considered the founding father of Indian botany, a Scottish surgeon who works in India. This is a, this is a book called Plants of the Coast of Coromandel, South India, and it includes illustrations of plants that are indigenous to the to the uh, to the uh, to South India. Now, this is a moment of global botany. This is a moment when these groves were being built in Braj. You have a new technique of governance, a new way of controlling the natural environment of colonies, not just South Asia, but in South America, in Africa. The expansion of colonial plantations that support tea, rubber, indigo, opium. But all of these colonial plantations that are being set up in the colonies also leads to massive deforestation and, and the, nat the natural environment is suffering. The people are suffering. So part of this larger global botany and colonialism, and it's very similar to today's uh, biotech, and agro companies that steal indigenous knowledge from across the world in the name of science and medicine. So in the same way, William Roxburgh collects the bio knowledge from the Coromandel course, and that produces modern science in Europe. So in this moment of global botany, colonialism, environmental devastation, I turn to the pilgrimage site of Braj, and I look at these groves that are being built. So the next image, for instance, shows this particular, uh, Ranu, can we move to the next image, please? I'm sorry, this is so difficult to manage via uh, Zoom. So this is a fabulous painting by an artist called Nihal Chan, based in Kishingar, the kingdom of Kishingar in West, uh, the previous slide, please, Ranu. This yeah. one, right? Thank you. So 
we have colonial botany, we have deforestation. And at this point, what is so interesting is that you have the rise of new poetry and painting that describes Praha just this pristine forest where Krishna and Radha spend their time. They roam this wilderness. They, they are part of this verdant sacred groves. So as deforestation is increasing, as colonial presence is increasing in the subcontinent, a poetic imagination becomes more prominent. And in the painting by this particular artist called Nihal Chand, we see Krishna and Radha on the left, lying in the sacred grove, beautiful brushwork, and the density of forest that, that is being made uh, visible through pigment. And this is the beginning of what we call the Anthropocene era, the, the theme that we were planning to talk about. This is precisely the era of our, our current geological period in which human activity has been the dominant force of the environment, on the environment. So what we have is this the rise of the Anthropocene, massive deforestation, colonialism, and then in the sacred site, you have the rise of this new poetics of, of Krishna worship, which is focused on, on gardens. So when I was looking at these paintings, I went to Braj and I was trying to find these gardens. Where are these gardens that are depicted in poet, painting that are talked about in literature over and again? How did these sweeping alterations in the region's agro landscape transform the notion of the power where Krishna and Radha would spend their time? I found a few. I found one, and the next slide shows that. Uh, Rana, can you have the next slide, please? You know, I think there's a lag because it's up on my screen. Oh. Is it there now? No. Okay, super. Oh, again, we move back. Thank you. So this is the sacred garden that's established in the 18th century. And on, on the left, you can see uh, aerial view. So this is dense urban center. The sacred site was the heart of the mercantile world of North India. So massive urban population, there's deforestation. But at this precise moment, you have the creation of this garden where apparently Krishna and Radha still spend their evening. So at night, the garden, the doors are shut so that we mere mortals do not disturb Krishna and Radha in their nocturnal tryst. But in the daytime, you can visit the garden and you can see how the trees are being shaped in a very interesting way. They're very small. So when I was there, I had to actually bend. I had to go through the trees. It's almost as if it was cre recreating this, this sacred forest of poetry and painting. So it's an effect of unspoiled nature and wilderness that is produced through gardening, architecture, poetry. Once we entered the sacred garden through the gateway, immediately we find a mass of jasmine creepers. And we have to make our way through this dense vines, imagining ourselves as Radha looking for Krishna. But all of this is happening when there is massive climate change and, and deforestation. So what I found very interesting about this site is that at this time of Anthropocene climate change, an imagination, a mythical, a mythopoetic imagination of sacred gardens are emerging in Braj. But one has to be careful because these are this is not the actual natural vegetation of the region. Because remember, this is completely deforested it's an urban center it's it's a it's a suburb of delhi literally so but it's a it's a it's a it's an imagination of sacrality it's an imagination of the natural world and we as devotees as pilgrims we are asked to play along and there's a particular notion of leela or play which essentially means that there's a it's a very corporeal bodily experience it's we walk through the, we smell the jasmines, we have to bend, we have to, we, the, the creepers catch on our clothes. So this was one of the chapters that focused on the idea of the sacred grove and how at a moment of industrial revolution, at a moment of economic transformations, the rise of modernity, there is an attempt to reimagine what the neat natural environment is. So this project and this book Allow, allows me to think about 
uh, how does one talk about environmental discourse? And I want to sort of end this uh, part segment with a proposition. And now in contemporary environmental discourse, the past is always seen as a period of ecological plenitude where humans live close to nature. We always think about the past as this, this Arcadian bucolic world where everything was good and people lived closer to nature and then came modernity and everything was disrupted. But climate change, it's, it's a longer duration problem. We have to think of deep time, long durations, not five years, 10 years, but at a scale of 500 years. So, what this allows us to do is when we start thinking of sacred spaces, sacred groves in, in specific, there is, an, there's a, there is a way in which we think about it as unchanging, primordial, untouched by modernity. Whether we think about Native American sacred sites in the US or we think about Af uh, groves in Africa, what this particular garden reminded me is that these groves were not representative of the region's vegetation. They were simulated gardens, they were artificial gardens. So rather than idealizing sacred biohabitats as static and unchanging, what I propose is a post-romantic approach to the study of sacred sites and plants. One that does not fetishize the pre-modern, that is one does not make the pre-modern into this other, into this sort of a bucolic space of alterity from the worlds that we live in, but one also that takes the resilience of religious conceptions of flora, fauna, the natural environment very seriously. And that has resonances in our world today. We see it globally. If you could go to the next slide, Rani. Thank you. Did it go? Yes. Okay. So think about the think about North Dakota. Ran was talking about how she works with this idea of of uh, the water warriors. What I found fascinating about about the, the 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 protests in North Dakota was the mobilization of a Lakota expression, the expression Miniwikoni, water is life. Now this is a protest of the present, but but the activists engage and work with pre-modern philosophical systems, Lakota philosophies of what of vital water, where water is not just a resource, water is not just uh, histories of water typically focus on governance, but here it's a way of life, it's a philosophical system. And what this particular uh, movement in North Dakota made visible to me was that there are other notions of the environment that at certain points would intersect with modernist ideas of nature as resource or wilderness. Think about John Moore and the wilderness movement here in California, vast, pristine. But at some other times it offers other ways of thinking interactions uh, between humans and the non-human that is not bound by modern notions of what the subject is and who the object is and the subject object binary that is fundamental to modernity, gets unraveled, uh, challenged by, by, let's say, a term like, a Lakota term like mini Vikoni, or even thinking about this relationship between plants and humans in India. So that was what my book was trying to do, was trying to think of other histories of environmentalism that is not limited to a certain presentist understanding of the past. The past is very complex, very rich. And I think that was what the book was trying to do. Rani, do you sure. want to? <laughs> um, I was, that's the next slide, but I was excited about maybe talking a little bit more um, just about the idea. I, you know, I've recently been reading Amitav Ghosh's work, and I think what you're saying reminds me a lot of his The Great Derangement, where he talks about this sort of way in which, um, you know, we have to kind of try to think bigger or think in a more epic way. And his, his, um, his conversation is really about literature and modernist literature and the way in the West, a lot of the modernist literature had us sort of or had had the writers um, 
basically making the individual experience the, the, the bigger, like the everyday was everything and everything was coming from this personal point of view. Um, and that the Indian epics had a more, a, a, a sort of situation where there are these like more non-human agencies. So I'm curious about, you know, thinking about this period that you talk about in your book where there's, um, there's, a, there's a drought, but people are making images of water, you know, there's a there's a, a a deforestation, but people are making these images of these really lush forests, and like how you know what that's a very different move than say making a documentary, making something about exactly how things are. Mm. No, and I think Amitav uh, Amitav's work sort of really was seminal, and I, what he was trying to artic what he articulated so beautifful in the in the book and called the great derangement was that climate change is a crisis of the imagination yeah it's a crisis of how do we tell stories and and it's I, and i really love it that 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 this particular series is called storytelling and catastrophes and storytelling whether it's in literary form or visual form i think storytelling and the role of imagination in 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 trying to understand how we think about the climate change and how we write the histories or paint the histories or make or, or annotate the histories of climate change. And I sort of want to, I mean, responding to Ranu's question, what we see on the screen are two uh, a photograph from Bombay and a, and a, and a, a image of the Canton waterfront, Guangzhou. So thinking about trees, that's returning to the broader theme of our conversation today. Uh, colonial botany was all about managing. It was all about ordering. It was making sense of the landscape, making it visible, creating vistas of governance, of power. So again, what we saw in Bombay, Shanghai, Benin, Hong Kong, was the planting of banyan trees as a way of, of managing the environment of the colony. A specific, very specific ecological regime, a vista, a view of governance and imperial control. But there's a lot of scholarship on, on, on colonial governance and the way in which colonial gardens, we, you mentioned the botanical garden in Calcutta, and how these gardens were a way of managing the natural landscape. I think what the epics or what other forms of storytelling offer us is a way of thinking human, non-human interactions that is not just about domination, that is not just about ordering, managing, bringing the natural, taming the natural environment. And what happens when these trees resist us? Can we write a history of trees resisting human, human management? Can we think of trees running wild? My favorite image, the next one uh, is, Ran, can you move to the next one, please? I did. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay, we're moving in no, different time zones. Kind of this is one of my favorite pictures. It's, it's a it. colonial depot in Calcutta, the, the, the capital of the British Empire, that's the heart of empire, the jewel in the crown and so forth. But what we see here is banyan trees literally running wild. Can you go back? running wild, these very trees that were planted by the colonial government to create a vista, a view, now have their own agency. They are taking over. They are rewriting colonialism. And what sort of a art history or visual practice can em emerge if we start taking the plants seriously? I mean, in art history, we, we are, it's a history of, of, it's a species history. It's a history of artists, patrons, audiences, but what, art has, what sort of an art history can emerge if we go beyond the species boundaries and start taking the tree seriously and the, the, the ruins of empire. And I mean, I find this image so poetic that the ruins of empire are now, now being controlled by this banyan tree that extends all over colonial, this particular colonial structure. And this idea of animism, that is, the agentiveness or agency of plants, of rocks, of animals, of non-humans. It's everywhere. The next slide. We all know this. 
the Lord <laughs> of the Rings, the Ents of the Middle Earth, who are <laughs> fighting catastrophic forces of large scale deforestation, or we can move to Bollywood. Since this is a talk on India, how can we not talk <laughs> about Bollywood? Aishwarya Rai was re- apparently, quote unquote, apparently, ritually married to a tree before <laughs> her mar- marriage to Abhishek Bachchan in order to counter the negative effects of being born under an adverse planetary constellation, Mangal Lake. So you have, whether you have Lord of the Rings or Aishwarya Rai marrying a tree. Now, Amitabh Bachchan, Aishwarya's father-in-law, completely denounced this. Said that they are not a superstitious family. They are not a backward family. Aish did not, Ash did not marry a tree, unless you think Abhishek is a tree. I, I was very intrigued by uh, Amitabh, the Big B's response to this rumor that Ash was marrying a, had to marry a tree. It, it really hit at something. What it hit at was a large, longer history, a 19th century history of colonial anthropology and, and this idea of animism that the primitive, that is the colonized, uh, who are like children. They cannot distinguish between animate and inanimate beings. So the Big B was very serious that they are not a superstitious family. They're not a big backward family. And all these rumors are just rubbish. <laughs> but what, what sort of worldviews emerge if we, if we take that seriously? If we take that rocks, rocks are animate, plants are animate. And returning to Mini Vikoni, the Lakota term, mm. can, we ha- can these terms, these ideas, these notions of, of the agency of the non-human have resonances today to fight climate change. Mm -hmm. The role of the past, the role of the epics. And that for me was a question, but I think I've spoken for around 30, but Ranu, I wonder if that sort of idea of the resonance of, oh, we've had enough enough of Big B, I think (laughs) we can move on. (laughs) Back to stop the slides. Yeah. Hang on, uh, I gotta get my technology rolling here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so I wonder if that this notion of the agent or the agency, the agency of plants plays out in your work and how do you engage with this idea? Because art history is very species centric. Yeah, no, I mean, it's something that I'm like, since doing that project, I'm trying to do more and more. And it's, it's lots of different kinds of uh, maybe non-human agencies enter the work. It's also really a question that um, then, ta- then you have to really tangle with the history of representation and where does the sort of pictorial and, this, the, and where does depiction come in? Um, and so if you have something that's kind of like, I, I try to think of this tree as being a protagonist. And in that particular instance, it's young, the tree could have a form um, that had some resonance with the form of the tree itself. But then when does it become abstracted into something else? And when does the, and so, you know, there are moments in the work where maybe, you know, the tree is actually still a protagonist, but nobody can see it visually as a sort of representation. So I think the question about, you know, using like having a, having something other than human have an agency. In some ways, I think that that's what's happening all the time when you're making work. I mean, I think that you're like, when you're in tune with things, um, there's all of these different kinds of of entities that speak to you or speak through you or something like that. Um, You know, if you're letting your conscious mind go for a little bit and and get into these things. But I also think that there's something about um, just, questioning the the representation of the landscape itself so for for i've, d- I've done this in a different a bunch of different ways and the banyan tree is one of the figures that has been like a protagonist you know i've also done work where i've tried to have people like for instance dancers um you know rolling around in the ash that happened in the fires in the recent fires in california and so it's another way of like um connecting with the landscape um, that's through a catastrophe, but that also is something that 
you know, how do you sort of connect with these realms of uncertainty without becoming completely traumatized to the point where you can't act? You know, so I think that that's a really big question. And I think if you have a relationship with other kind, other sorts of life forms, it seems more doable. I mean, it's, yeah, or something like that, you know? And I also think that art practice given the very material nature of art making. I mean, it's fundamentally an engagement with, with the agentiveness of other, other right. forms. I mean, right. pigments have their own agentiveness. Um, you, yeah. However much you force color, color, mm -hmm. runs its, color has its own agentiveness. So I think, you know, I find art history and art practice really central to thinking about these uh, debates on vibrant matter that have emerged in the recent past about the, the idea of materiality. And also what I, I wonder, I mean, as someone who thinks about painting very seriously, I mean, how would you, could we talk about, let's say, the material, the, the agentiveness of pigment? I mean, I wouldn't say that the pigment has agency in that notion of that it has a subject or a political will, but it certainly forces the artist to move in a certain direction even so yeah. so i wonder if that sort of work yeah. well i mean it does you know there's sort of so many physical properties of the pigment itself like where the thing about where it comes from and the different minerals and you know but for me it's the it's the it's the it's the space it becomes like a space that's not neutral Right. in some way you know so part of the reason that I needed to paint those walls with de Young was to make the space make the place into this make a kind of environment with which to collage and so when I start making a piece of work I always start with what's the color the ground um, which I really do associate with ground like what's the relation so this question of figure ground that is sort of completely part of what a painting is, you know, is that the the ground becomes a forceful environment through color, you know, through chroma and through the, and I do use powdered pigment very specifically because, you know, you have to really pay attention to it. It's not just kind of coming out of a tube, like you have to mix it up and then you have to figure out exactly what that shade is doing. And I don't know how to describe what it's doing also, like I can't, it's not symbolic. It's not like I'm using red because it's an angry color or something. Like it's, you know, I don't think about it like that. It's, it, I do think of it as a sort of force. Um, right. And I think that, I mean, only recently has art history taken the force of pigment seriously. And I, it'll really change the ways because essentially how we think about art for art history and it, it's enlightenment roots. It's, it's really about our, the human species when I say our, it's our way of controlling, whether you're a sculptor and you control stone and stone, that the fact that the stone has its own own process and the stone has to be thought through its own, own vitality. And I think right. these sort of questions in a way also take us back to a certain non-Eurocentric ways of thinking uh, art making and and thinking about art making in which it is not just about how we can control dominate and order whether it's pigment or the garden or, or stone and and that i think in a way opens up this in the question of indigenous epistemologies where where you you like we think about uh, lakota philosophical systems and how these philosophical systems can offer other ways of thinking histories of water or stone or pigment. But yeah, because there's all this listening culture that's attached to them. So like, and there's a there's a culture of time that's different, you know, like from, you know, like, I mean, I have to make, say I put down a ground, it'll take me until I figure out what is next. I mean, I have to leave the ground to sit there for a little while before I can actually put something else there. I'm almost like you have to listen to. And I think that those kinds of indigenous methodologies are also like a lot, have a lot to do with, you know, that kind of listening. Right. Speaking of which, where are we? Do you think we have questions that we should 
go to or I would yeah, let's do that. Let's do yeah. that. So I have I'm been just... instructed that I will be getting questions. From... Okay, good. <laughs> So okay. maybe this is a time where we segue and I, for those who are joining us, I mean, please join in the conversation. Yeah, if anyone has questions. Comments. I want to ask one thing if we don't have questions yet, um, just about the moment that we're in, because I remember when we were talking and preparing for this, you know, I was thinking about this idea of trees being the lungs of the planet and this sort of, you know, this sort of idea that's around about, um, you know, just that this, we have this situation that is being shaped by a virus that attacks the lungs. And this idea of the breath and the air and how important and central that's become in terms of our thinking at the moment. Um, and I remember you talking about doing some work around St. Helena and this idea. Yeah. I was wondering if you could yeah, just- absolutely. I mean, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, the idea of, of gardens or or, or forests being the lung of the lungs of the planet, and and the ir irony of this is that it's actually a colonial intervention. Uh, idea. The idea of conservation, the idea that that uh, protecting forests. So it begins with in Saint Vincent in the Caribbean, when I was I was talking about uh, El Nino droughts. Uh, El, that El Nino monsoon failures, and that was devastating the natural environment. And it was this moment that that the, the colonial authorities decided to create a uh, protected forest. So this idea of a protected forest that we are so familiar with, whether it's in California, in the U.S., which we assume begins in the 20th century or the late 19th century. So the the, the scholarship on on conservation, forest conservation, sort of point towards the wilderness movement in California as a beginning, but it's actually a much, uh, there's a longer history. So the law was put into force in St. Helena, India, in the Caribbean, and because of the El Nino droughts, and this idea that, this idea that if we created forests, the lungs of the planet, protected forests that would help rainfall and thus avert agrarian crisis. So these were not, these were not pro-environment. This was a very selfish policy right. because there was massive agrarian crises happening because of the droughts. There was an assumption that if we protect forests, that we would produce rain, that there would be rainfall and that would lead to uh, a better uh, agriculture. Now, Edmund Burke, for instance, the political theorist Edmund Burke, to uh, refers to the high mortality rate in India because of the 1791 drought in his critique of his East India Company. And the, the botanist that I began with, the Scottish botanist, William Roxburgh, was studying droughts in the subcontinent and studying climate change. So the study of climate change is, begins in the 18th century and conservation as we know it today begins in the 18th century with these, uh, with these um, attempts to create a forest. So it's a very interesting history. And that, that, for better or for worse, the creation of the wilderness movement is part and parcel of colonialism and part and parcel of that history of deforestation and afforestation at the same time. Right, right. But what for me is also interesting about this history is that and we say, see it play out today in many parts of the world, that the creation of a protected forest is at the, the cost of the, the indigenous communities who live there. So if you think about Yosemite, when, when this, the, the John Moore created the wilderness movement, who got affected? Mm. The, the Native American population who were living there for many years. And, and this guy was a racist. Uh, he said he he essentially said that the Native American people who live who have been historically living here and with such minimal car, uh, effect on the environment was the problem. Right. So I think what is also one has to remember that afforestation or protecting forests, in a way, affects 
the indigenous communities who live around there. And I mean, only a few days back, I was reading this essay in the New York Times. It's about tigers and the tiger in the Bronx Museum had COVID, but the tiger in the national forest in India also had COVID. So, and remember that, that what is interesting about uh, the, the national tiger reserves in India is that it's the largest population of tigers in the wild. So immediately right. what the government does is to protect the tigers. They ask the local villagers who live around the protected forests, who live on subsistence, who, who uh, look at, who g- gather honey and etc. from the forest reserves. Immediately, the government says that they should be removed. So it's, it has always been that these communities who live in these forests in these areas yeah, are, who are being affected the most by this sort of North American variety of wilderness movement, or if you go back, the sort of colonial idea. It's, it's a form of colonialism. It's a form of, of arbitrarily selecting a piece of land and saying that this should be protected at the cost of, and there are scholars who call that call for a new way of thinking environmentalism, which they would say it's environmentalism of the poor, Mm -hmm. rather than importing the the wilderness movement, the North American variety. Scholars have argued that we have to think about other practices of environmentalism in the global South, or in in Africa, Asia, and South America, which is not about making migrants or, or forcing people out of their uh, local context in the name of protecting animals and forests. Right. And we saw it, we see it playing out in Palestine, we see it playing out in many parts of the world today. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. So it's you, on the one hand, it, it's a form of greenwashing. Right. On, right. on the one hand, you're like, yeah, we are protecting forests, we are building these forests, but at whose cost? The cost right. is always the poor. The poor always bear the cost of pro or anti-environmental practices. Okay, I'm looking at my phone. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I mean, I also would, let's going back to your project and I was very intrigued by this idea of the Banyan tree as both protective, but also the space where where uh, where you would have, let's say, the, the so-called mutineers of 1857 or, or the no, being hung there. So I think there is this very interesting play between violence and protection of benevolence and dystopia that's associated with the trees. I wonder if you would... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it just seems to be um, a site because I think, I guess it's like when we were talking before about this idea of the sacred and what happens when, you know, something becomes sacred, you know, that it, it ha- it always has this, I mean, depending on who's going to kind of like wield it, if it's wieldable, um, it always has this problem, but it's also, if you, if, if I'm just taking it as a figure, you know, the fact that it actually strangles its host um, you know, for me, it was a really, I mean, it's historically been this site. It also is, I think, in the Kikuya people, I th- there's, there's a, I, I've read several stories from different places, right? So there's like, I know in different parts of Africa, the same tree, which has a different name there. Um, it's considered like if one of them dies, it's considered a very, um, a, a, a political, um, omen like a bad omen or something politically and so they have to sort of do a big ritual to make sure that the sort of leadership of the particular village where the tree has died is doesn't get deposed or something like that so the the tree seems to have this sort of power in places but I think also just as a figure to think about ecology and culture that you know I I mean what you're saying about this sort of benevolent, supposedly benevolent green, you know, efforts, the, the idea that you can kind of like protect everything by displacing some people and making it, you know, 
giving the trees the space. I, I don't know. You know, it's it, it's a form I think of music, helps, musicizing. I think it yeah. helps. Yeah, it helps to think about the complexity of the whole situation, which is that you know we're in a situation where we're consuming more. I mean, even the green energies consume a lot of you know rare earth elements, tree, also wood, wood chipping. There's all of these kinds of twists in um, in the way that the that in order in order to continue as we are, we just have to keep consuming. So I mean, it's just sort of points to the notion that there needs to be a kind of whole philosophical shift, like you were speaking of at the beginning of this talk. You know, that like it's not just a matter of finding another way to consume the way we're consuming. Um, you know, it, it's and and to be able to think sort of both individually and collectively is important. I think there's something about the way the tree is both a home to all of these species and a colonial force itself that displaces other things around it is an important lesson. You know, that maybe it has to teach us, right? Um, that, that there's not a kind of monocultural solution to our our, our problem, and also to it as a figure of the imagination. Also, to go back to Amitav Gosh, you know, there's this like need to try to figure out how to, to to imagine in a magnitude that includes uh, a complexity of of thought. It's not just like oh, we're going to find this one happy solution or something. And um, yeah, I think the question of scale is a very important one in terms yeah. of thinking whether we talk about uh, individual histories or species histories or the imagine species imaginations but it's almost 455 so i wanted to sort of go back to the question of the museum and i i i'm fascinated mm -hmm. by the fact of how you activate the space of the museum the exhibitionary complex how do you activate the space of the museum and i did not know that there was a taxidermy collection in the horizon <laughs> and right well there's yeah the, the taxidermy collection is not in the museum but when i was looking up the history of the museum michael de young actually wanted to open a museum because he had this collection of stuffed birds that he didn't know what to do with right mm. <laughs> he didn't know where to put them so his idea was to open a museum to put them in which he didn't raise the funds before he had to sell the collection of birds before he could raise the funds. But it's sort of how he became a museum person and how the de Youngs became this museum family in the Bay Area. Um, and so I just, I kind of wanted to think about that because that museum, you know, ha is still has this like 19th century model and it's also an ethnographic model where there are these kind of sections of the museum that like represent different places. And, you know, I sort of always think about that when I'm putting things in a space. Well, it's, it has a long history to the Kunstkammers of the great, the, of the early modern period and the birth of natural history. Mm -hmm. And that led to both where you collect naturalia, that is specimens from across the world, but also, uh, also, I'm sorry, this is very difficult. So, <laughs> mm. you're getting pinged. I'm getting pinged, and I am wondering how we. So, so yeah. Uh, so, apparently, we have questions. Which, okay. Well, I'm going to just say one quick thing is yeah. which is Black Panther came out when I was also making that work and you couldn't not i couldn't not be thinking about the colonial history of the museum <laughs> right and i think it's very interesting to sort of go back to this colonial history and sort of de reactivate that that history through new ways of thinking about human non-human interactions thinking about indigenous epistemologies thinking about how these other histories of plants animals rocks can take us beyond that sort of a uh, european early modern scientificism that, that really is the birth of modern rational, rational thinking that has marginalized 
so many philosophical systems. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought, well, those birds, they're extinct, but they're still talking. Right. You know, they're saying a lot of things, just like some of these objects, they might have been sort of caged, but they still have, you know, a lot to say. So what would what would they be saying? I mean, it was like asking a question of like, what do those birds have to say? I'm still asking that question. <laughs> and how do we how do we even creatively think going back to the question of Amitav Ghosh, the question of uh question of how one talks about uh, imagination yeah how do we how do we imagine into this and how and that's something i like to work on with myself and also with other people so uh, ran so can can you ranu this is i'm ventriculizing for uh <laughs> for the audience uh can you say more about how you engage with artists dancers uh with uncertainty without re-traumatizing and also oh. can we relate to gore's art and poetry to climate change i'm okay, happy wait. to take a second question but the first question is can you say more about how you engage artists or dancers without with uncertainty without re-traumatizing no, re um that's something i'm asking myself a lot of questions about right now the project um that i was sort of thinking about when i when I talked about that is one that I worked on in the wake of the 2017 fires in California. And I was thinking I had these dancers, um, I worked with Hope More Dance um, and we worked with some dancers to improvise in the remains of the fires. And it was a way of trying to think about how you, if you just bury a trauma, it gets bigger and if you let it become it it, it becomes a, a, an entire a weight but there needs to be a way of kind of hang so i was thinking about the figure in the ground literally as a as a um that the idea that of the relationship between the figure and the ground is actually a critical relationship right now in this moment of history and then at the moment, I'm trying to devise a project where I want to work with um, Divian populations, also with Hope More. Um, and this project is called Ensemble for Nonlinear Time. And it's specifically trying to think very much about this, um, to work with people who are either resettled refugees or were lost things in the fire. And I think that we're all in this situation right now. So I'm kind of working with this for myself, but I'm trying to think a lot about the way rupture it can be a catalyst and if you make rupture into a cat uh, into a character right so i'm thinking a lot about speculative fiction and if we take a rupture as a character and try to imagine how it moves changes what it does over time um, in a way that doesn't that we don't over identify it with it it's not it doesn't become us the trauma is not us the trauma is something that's that happens and is moving over time, like this virus is happening right now. Um, how do we sort of characterize it and then like listen to it? I mean, how do we understand how to listen to something traumatic and how to learn from it? So that's sort of my approach. I don't have an answer really about how to do that, but I think that that's part of what the work has been for me. Um, so one of the things that I do also is to trace news images over and over again, and I, I sort of overlay them onto paper. And that's a way for me to kind of process a lot of traumatic news, but also to look at it in a, in a way that's, um, that doesn't, that doesn't um, trick me into thinking I actually know more than I do. So I think that a lot, of, I'm trying to kind of break down also our, our image culture in certain ways. Cause I think the way that like media images and also a lot of marketing works, which is what we're sort of saturated in is that it works by kind of trying to convince culture that we know something, that things are certain. And so I think that we're sort of allergic to uncertainty. We're developing a sort of, I think we need more to have more capacity for uncertainty than the um, sort of dominant cultural uh, modes, particularly of visual, visual culture, are, are are giving us right. So I think it's about sort of I'm actually expanding the capacity for uncertainty through 
art making for me. But I think that there's lots of ways to expand that capacity that may maybe are, are other than art making. All right. So, Raj, I'm sorry, Raj asks, how do you relate Tagore's art and poetry to climate change? I mean, that's a very interesting question. I just recently heard a talk by a very eminent historian, Deepesh Chakraborty, who was talking about Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore's writing on on trees and how Rabindranath Tagore wrote about uh, becoming a tree. In my own work, I've written on art history and how in Shantiniketan, Kala Bhavan Art School in Shantiniketan, this particular art historian called Stella Cramrish reimagined Buddhist sculpture in terms of plants, uh, mm -hmm. not just in terms, because when we think about sculpture and that's what we, uh, let's say the history of sculpture, it's always about mapping the, the sculpture in terms of the human body. The human body, the logocentric body from the 16th century becomes the center of the universe. So even when we think about sculpture, we, we always map it to the human body. Now Stella Cramerish in the 1930s proposes this very interesting model of understanding Buddhist art through a through idea of transubstantiation, where she argues that, that the body of the Buddha becomes vegetal becomes plant-like. So I think it's a very interesting way of thinking about sculpture where we do not again privilege the human body. What does it mean for the Buddha to become a plant and the human and the vegetal to merge and in immanent energy? So I think Shantiniketan and sort of the critical writing, the music, the poetry, the literature, the visual arts really offered us a way of thinking about climate change and, and that not much has been written on it. I think it's a very interesting project to think about climate change, especially as it was, as it was developed by the Tagores in Shantini Ketan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Joan asks, have you encountered Eleanor Ostrom's work dem demonstrating how local communities around the world almost always manage their local resources better than the governing body? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds I, about right. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, the critique of top-down development, I think it's very important, especially with, when we think about climate change. And I mean, there's a very, it's a very important move that has to be made that we cannot export North American notions of wilderness. And we have to think about other ways of engaging uh, biodiversity that does not take us back to that early 20th century model. And I think a lot of nonprofits from across the global south have have been pushing forward to think about new policies that involve local communities local resources and it just not being a trickle down effect from from let's say the center in in, in let's say the in the point in the case of south asia well we're almost out of time did you <laughs> do you want to add something um, I want to just say one quick other thing about uncertainty, which is that I think that there, I think that what we're talking about with, um, these questions of like letting, you know, having people to manage their own resources or, you know, what I'm trying to get at by thinking with people who have been through some sort of major cataclysmic change, which now a lot of people have been through or going through, is this idea of expertise. And that like, you know, local or, or expertise. I mean, I think that, you know, to ask people who have the expertise and ra rather than victimize them. So I feel like there's a sort of problem where most often people who are considered victims are actually experts. Yeah. And um, maybe I'd leave it at that. Like we need to talk to the experts or listen to the experts and with, with non-human experts too. Like, Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Right. Well, let me, big thanks to you, Ranu, for joining us virtually yeah. for today's Commonwealth uh, Club program. As I noted earlier, this is the second in a series of programs between the Commonwealth Club and the Townsend Center for Humanities at, at Berkeley. The next program will be announced shortly. Please visit commonwealthclub.org to learn more. Thank you again. I'm Shugota Ray, and this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club
a place where you are in the know is a journey. Thank you.